are live here on Soul Fire. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. My name is Christopher, the Astro Medium, and welcome to the Chronicles of Chiron, the Lion, the Witch, and the Healer. We have a very special guest with us tonight. My co-host, Jessica Tanzel, could not join us, so I invited a shamanic practitioner into this healing space to get her side of this whole shaman thing that everyone's talking about these days because it wasn't cool at one point now it's cool so introduce yourself sure i'm gina millard i'm located here in louisville kentucky and i you know everything i do comes under the umbrella of shamanism and i just love the work it's good to be here perfect. then you are the perfect guest for us so for those of you who are just joining us chiron is the archetypal wounded healer in astrology i am an astro medium so my i am intuitive very metaphysical and spiritual but i also specialize in astrological sciences and in astrology chiron's the energy of transmuting pain into power and healing the primal wound and i feel when we use the word primal we really could tie that to shamanic work. Yes, yes. And you know what I love about it is that the shaman or the shamanic practitioner is known as the wounded healer. So we have a great affinity. Uh, yeah, you can't make that up, can you? Yes. And, with Chiron, exactly. Yeah, and with Chiron, he has his wife, Kariklo, who, and she is a sea nymph, but she's also the feminine archetype, who is, all, who is also, uh, shamanism is fits under her, her umbrella as well. So I feel like this is a perfect conversation to have, and this is the perfect time for this conversation, as just in about two hours, a little less than two hours, the moon in Scorpio is going to form in opposition to the sun, and we're gonna have the full moon in Scorpio. So this is all about shadow work. It's all about deep inner transformation and healing at a soul contract level. And that's why I found it pertinent to bring in shamanism to the conversation. So Gina, how long have you been doing this? Oh my gosh, I've been, well, um, been doing the work for a long time. Um, seeing people or doing it in a more above ground way, probably about eight, nine years. And then my personal work before that, for sure, in, in different areas other than shamanism. But it all falls under that, that umbrella, like I said now. So yeah. So was this something that you kind of kept hidden or was it something that you just, it took time to kind of build yourself into? You know, I always had a really strong connection to spirit and had extraordinary experiences in nature, even though I grew up in New York, you know, in the city and then out on the island. Mm -hmm. um, but all these things, you know, magical, magical things happened. And then when I, you know, went through the whole spiritual experience, and ended up in a shamanic journey in class, it put the framework and the words around my whole life. Let's Everything talk about that. Tell me about the shamanic journeying class you said it was a class it was a beginning um shamanic journey in class really where we all start and they're taught all over the country absolutely um the what where i come from is from core shamanism from all the um cultures the commonalities of the cultures that are pulled together and then we put our energy into it and and bring it forward that way um, so, you know, all our ancestors had shamanic roots. If we go way, way back, that connection to spirit, because it was about their survival. We, you know, I always say we got busy, we kind of jumped off and now a lot of people are coming back and it's not, I always say, not about learning something new. It's about reawakening. A shamanic reawakening is what's happening now because we need it. We need it bad. So tell me, what is shamanism? For the because there are people watching who may not have ever heard of this or who have heard of this, but there's a lot of mi common misconceptions around this topic, and a lot of it is very sacred and very um, sacred to certain indigenous cultures and things like mm -hmm. that. So I know we want want to be sensitive about the way we word things as well. Absolutely. But for you, what is a shaman, and do you consider yourself a shaman? I call myself a shamanic practitioner out of um, respect for the work, out of respect for spirit. I'll never claim the title. You know, I could say, you know, is this, this a cultural, um, yeah, sensitive to culture or is this being 
Is it humility or both? And, and, and not just a culture, to spirit, because spirit is the one that's doing the work. Our job is to be the channel. So the answer is yes, yes, and yes. Um, <laughs> you know, that's, that, that, and that's part of, you know, part of our belief, part of our creed, you know, because it is sacred work. Yes. Um, yeah. yeah. So what exactly makes a shaman? Okay. Well, let me explain what shamanism is, and that's probably the best, because a shamanic practitioner is one who practices shamanism. And shamanism is rooted in the belief that everything is energy. Everything has life force on some level, has spirit. And so our job is to be able to connect with the spirit in all things, the divinity in all things, and have a relationship with that. We have a relationship with plants, with trees, with the earth, with weather, it, with all things. And then to be able to have the conversation for healing, for information, um, for guidance. And that's, that's in a nutshell what it is. I mean, we could also consider shamanism. Shamanism is also considered a healing modality. And that is why you are here. So that was my next question is um, it's shamanic work uh, is being used for deep transformation and healing work. And that's really what I want to get to the nitty gritty about. But still for me, I still kind of want to know is being a shaman something you're called to? Is it something that you are, is innately in you or is it something that someone can choose to do? It, it, it traditionally comes in a, ver a variety of ways. There were some traditions where in the culture it would be passed down generation to generation intentionally. The, the shaman, the sha I'll say shaman for, for our time today. Yeah, yeah, well, if we're talking about thousands of years ago. Yeah, it, yeah that's it, what yeah, we would say. Yeah, shaman. Right, exactly. So it might be passed down lineage-wise. Okay. The other thing that might have happened is that a, a community member, um, someone might come to the shaman for healing work. They might have been marked in some way, epilepsy, emotional um, fracturing, physical illness. They would come and the exchange at that point wasn't necessarily money like it is today. The, the exchange often was they would come for the healing with the agreement that they would step into the work. Mm. Um, so it can be it brought forward it that, way. that way today. I know that for a fact. In yeah. In cases, yes. Yeah. And as I said, you know, your life path can bring you here, you know, because it, in some ways we are all so connected to spirit, whether we're aware of it is the question or not. You know, so so shamanism does that. It just kind of guides you along. You might get a nudge. You might hear the word, oh, and be interested. And then you might hear it again a couple of months later. And as spirit does, it'll nudge, it'll nudge, it'll nudge until it slams. Until it says. You say that because I feel very nudged to it. And yeah. I have for years. Um, yeah. And even before I knew what it was, those types of this type of work is something that resonates with me very strongly. So I am very familiar with the process of shamanic soul retrieval, which I know is a, um, a healing modality offered in shamanic work. Are there any other ways and healing modalities within shamanism? Yeah, oh yeah. And shamanism, before I launch into this, has a really um, good way of terming all their heal healing modalities or in very kind of dramatic ways. So you mentioned soul retrieval. Yeah, let me, let me talk about the two ways um, of healing and shamanism, really, because we look at illness, emotional, physical, spiritual illness or imbalance at the very root as the result of one of two things. Either we've lost life force energy, pieces of ourselves, this is the soul retrieval part, yes, yes. pieces of ourselves through life experience and often trauma. It can be through illness, loss, grief. It can be also through 
um, harsh words said to you at a critical period of time that all of a sudden you've never been the it same. It has to be a, you know, a car accident or an extreme abusive situation, especially to a highly sensitive person yes. in path who's system is more sensitive that could leave a deeper trauma than it would on another child it it's really to the individual yes it's their pain it's their loss it's yeah. exactly very individual. has a way of validating yeah. people's pain as well yes by acknowledging that it's real and that there is a mechanism to this fracturing is the word you used earlier this fracturing yeah. that occurs Right, right. And when we lose that life force energy, and I'll talk about soul retrieval in a minute, it's about bringing that back. Oh, yeah, I'm not going to let you go unless we talk about it. Yeah, I know, we're getting there. <laughs> but the other, at the other root is we can be carrying energy that doesn't serve us, that results in imbalance and illness and yada, yada, yada. Oh, well, see, I didn't realize this would go in that direction. But now that I've mentioned empath and that sort of thing, and not that yeah. he is self-proclaimed empath to absorb energy or to take on a type of yeah. energy, but is that what you're referring to? Yes, it can be all kinds. It can be all kinds of energy where, you know, we're carrying that may not even be ours, doesn't serve, um, can be passed down from past generations because, so you know, our trauma. Yes. Our ancestors, you know, I'll say did the best they could in the given situation. They taught us how to respond to the world, to respond to trauma. Does their way necessarily serve us in this lifetime? No, no, it may not. And, um, you know, it's about unwinding that. We would call that curse unraveling. Um, so when you asked about the different, you know, modalities so or, you know, ways. We're looking at these two here because there may be mm -hmm. different ways of doing each one. Yes. But really, there's these two and things branch off from there. It's all about energy. It's either about bringing it back or, well, bringing it back on this side or letting or it go. Yes. It. Yes. Very, very good. Yeah. Inhaling and exhaling. I understand. It's, it's bringing back. I get it. So. Yeah within this modality, for instance, curse unraveling, that could be used as a form of healing, especially if what ails the person coming to you, the sitter, mm -hmm. that if it's energy that they've taken on, describe what kind of energies these may be that are well, let, really let, Yeah, let's look at the person who curses us the most. And that's us. Ourselves, yes. Yes, it absolutely is. But um, a curse can be as simple, and it's not simple, but as basic as a thought form that we've taken yeah. on as our reality. So I'm so glad you said that because I really want to demystify the idea of curse as if some gypsy did it to you at some carnival or something, or someone paid somebody to put something on you. There's yeah. a lot of that that I hear out there in the world. Yeah. There's a lot of wearing things to keep the evil eye away and things. We're not really talking about that. We're talking about an energy that gathers momentum, if you will, yes. through yes. its attention, kind of like um, thought forms, but these spirits that these children will see, which are actually like dark figures, but they're yes. actually just thought forms that created by the child that represent the trauma or pain that they're going through. I've met a lot of these children or adults in the work that I do who, I can't remember the name of it, but see these beings and knew once they got older that it was created by them. Is that something that shamanic work, for instance? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And really the best thing for, for a child, really, who is experiencing something like that is not to do the work for them, but to empower them. Yes. You know, teach them that they are in charge. You know, how to um, be in charge of their own energy. How to stand in their power. You created that so you can turn it into something else. Right, right. And also, you know, teach them to be in connection with their guides, that they're not in this alone. Um, you know, they're power animals. Kids, kids take to this work like nobody's business because it awesome. is a natural. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, from in the curse unraveling section of this, um, I'm sure there's a lot that fits under that umbrella. What kind of work, without going into detail with people's names or anything, have you done in that arena? And what results have these people seen? Oh, I can, you know, the best, best one I can talk about is my own. 
Okay. Um, you know, because I, you know, I'm okay sharing that, but it's, it's been, you know, there's just all kinds of, of curse work, but let me, let me give you one experience of mine. Because then I want to um, give you an experience and I want you to tell me if what happened to me was shamanic. Okay. So please go ahead. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and in my book, nothing's not shamanic. <laughs> so, I, I understand okay. why, but fitting under the umbrella, yeah. like yeah. what this woman did, what she just go. We'll get there. We'll get there. <laughs> no, years ago, I was diagnosed with an illness and it was bad at first. And then I realized, wait a second, you know, I've taken this on. There was a diagnosis. There was significant issue kind of thing. And then I started realizing how much energy I was pouring into it. Mm -hmm. I was feeding it. Yes. And then the other piece I realized through journey work is that what I was doing was reenacting the way of responding to trauma, anger, fear that my grandmother did by turning it inward until it started consuming me. Mm -hmm. And so, and my drum just, just popped. I heard, so I that's heard, the valid, I heard validation. It. I <laughs> that's heard always it. validation. She was saying, you got it, girl. Now yeah. thank you for healing it for us. Yeah, exactly. And then so to unwind that, to turn that energy outward, you know, for expression that needed to happen, yeah. that was Rock being that turned too. inward. And, and I've been rock stable since. Rock stable. Wow. No. How long? Yeah. And that's yet? 20 years. Wow. And yeah. for me to really embrace shamanic work, um, because look, you don't, people have misconceptions about things. You don't look. Yeah like a shaman. A shaman should be a, a Native American person or, a, or an Asian person dressed in garb. And this is, they live in a hut somewhere up on the mountain. I know. You're, the, you're a modern shamanic practitioner. So, well, okay, go ahead. go ahead. No, you go ahead. No, the thing of it is that's really important is to acknowledge the cultures where this was practiced before, and that's in every corner of the world. Yes. Every corner. You know, we hear a lot about Peruvian shamanism and Native American shamanism, but it's not, it's not about pretending to be something we're not. It's about stepping into the energy, the line of the work, and bringing our own to it while still honoring the ancestors and those who came before us. What you will see in American shamanism, a lot of times the things we use in ceremony may look very Native American. But when we think about using natural, working with, not using, working with natural elements and putting things together, we're using or pulling we're in the same from, thing. Yeah. We're, we come from the same place. Yes, yes. You know, yeah. So I went through spontaneous kundalini awakening a few okay. years ago, and I did not know that's what was happening to me, although it's sure. plain and simple, but I needed to, you know, I finally was guided a friend told me to go see a woman and you may know her um her name is penny oh yeah. yes yes so that's all i'm gonna say about that yeah. <laughs> but what she did um she did a, she used a lot of native american um artifacts or you could say that they were um the lineage or why someone would use that yeah. would come from a native american culture um, she used feathers, she used an owl wing, of course, sage and all of that burning herbs. Um, but she, um, she put undyed silk over my face and there was a whole thing that she did. There were, and there was heat coming off of the feathers and she was fanning it away from my body. And she told me after that was actually when I knew a hundred percent that I was an empath because she said, you're an empath. You need to know this. Um, this is why you've come here. I've just you took on a lot of people's energy. You took on hate, yeah. anger, revenge. You took a lot of, and it didn't belong to you. And I've cleared that for you. She did not say you're going through Kundalini awakening because I think what happened was the Kundalini awakening brought those things to the surface yeah. and intensified my nervous system and made it 10 times more sensitive because I was very sensitive to light and sound. Yeah. And I didn't sleep for 21 days and I slept that night after I saw her. Yeah. And I totally planned on getting back in the car and panicking again and having the anxiety come right back because I was having severe panic and anxiety and like this yeah. um, dro heart dropping in the stomach. And she said, your body is safe now. And 
just was what happened to me? Could you consider that shamanism? Because Absolutely. I would. I would. I, you know, I would ask her, you know, what she terms her work. You know, and I don't want to speak was for very, her. She, yes, but she was very vague about it. Almost like it's my own thing I've come up with, yeah. you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. But it was very strategic. There were flowers or um, feathers placed on specific chakras yeah. to move the solar plexus and the um, heart, mm -hmm. excuse me, the sacral, the solar plexus and the heart. And heat started to come off of them and she started to do things with her voice and and i'm not going to go into too much more detail but it was actually kind of frightening at some point very vocal almost like i could she was having us both of us use sound to push it out almost okay and i thought this is ridiculous i need to get out of here and it it was one of the only experiences i've had where i had the difference that you're looking for when you go yeah. to something like this and to me that feels almost like curse unraveling and it wasn't that someone put a curse on me it was that yeah. i put on something yeah so, and we don't even have to term it something you know we have to have a language to speak to share right. information but you know what i'm hearing from you is that spirit was moving through her and guiding the session and that's what shamanism was because she knew things she just like just like you i'm sure you have mediumship or psychic abilities how could you not after doing this work even when you went in thinking you weren't it would just open you up after a while you know right psychics mediums we're not special there's just something's more open or more activated than someone else who may have a more physical or agile physical body like who's an athlete which i'm not so we all have our different things but from what and i hear a lot out there is people talking about shamanism i'm a shaman and people talking about this shamanic soul retrieval and it's a very hot topic and it's being used um, because plant medicine for instance is very very um, popular right now and is gaining a lot of popularity for its healing benefits its um, creativity boosting benefits so many reasons and of course social media the internet is making all of this available to all of us and I definitely have seen a lot of results with plant medicine work, but I feel very called to shamanic soul retrieval because of trauma and things like that. So I really want you to deep dive and tell us what is shamanic soul retrieval now that we understand the unraveling part. What is this? What? And you can also go into what it isn't. So people have a really good idea of if this is something that they can utilize in their healing practices and in their own journey. Sure, sure. It, what I can tell you is it's powerful and beautiful work, and it can be life-changing. Um, you know, for my practice, I do not use the plant medicine piece or the hallucinogenic piece in right. this. So what this is, is session works where so someone... Do shamans incorporate plant medicine when they're journeying? Say that again? Would some shamanic practitioners use plant medicine to journey or because so, well some do the I think way you're that, talking about it is as if some people do and you choose not to and I just want to make sure that no um, some people use plant you know will say they've gone on a plant medicine journey that they use the plant or they work I don't like the word use I completely shamanism. Yeah, I have worked with plant medicine before yeah Yes, exactly. Then you understand that some people are called to that way and, and that's absolutely fine. And I can't say never for me. It just right. hasn't happened at that, this point. Sure. Um, though the journey work um, can happen with or without. I mean, we learn to journey and likely everybody has journeyed without even knowing it. Yeah, um, absolutely. Because like we all get into meditative states. We all channel yeah. at some point when we're in the zone and we're just... Yeah. Things are just coming out. We're writing and it's like, it's effortless. All of that's channeling states. Yeah. Right. So what does soul retrieval look like? What, what is a soul retrieval session look like? That, that's probably the best way to do it. Someone comes and they may not even realize they, they have usually people come to me out of trauma. Mm -hmm. um, with some kind of trauma that they're dealing with. They've done a boatload of therapy usually, not always have done a boatload of therapy and there's just one little missing piece or there's something that they just can't quite get, you know, situated that it's okay, I'm good to go and move forward. 
So what happens is we go into journey. I go into journey. First I'll journey before the person ever comes in the door. I do what's called a pre-diagnostic journey. And I just ask spirit what needs to be known. And then the person coming in, I ask them to set an intention for their session. Bef you know, as soon as they book. So that means the work is already started. And when they come in the door, we combine what comes from spirit, their intention, and find out what work needs to be done. And then I will go back into journey and ask to be guided. So what does soul retrieval look like? Usually there's an extraction piece that comes forward or before the actual soul retrieval work. Mm -hmm. There may be energy that's being released, yet always with permission. Shamanism is always with permission if it's ethically done. Mm -hmm. So with that person's permission and they're helping in the release of it. And then we realize when we remove something, we never leave a void. We're channeling energy, spirit energy and sealing it. Mm -hmm. And then if we're told by spirit, if we're guided in the journey that soul retrieval needs to happen, that they have lost life force energy, spirit will guide the way and tell us where was it lost? At what point, you know, what age, what is it? We are not going back in a session to the scene of the trauma. People have already been through that and likely hashed and hashed and hashed it, you know, with, you know, doing their due diligence, doing their right. work. But we're going back to the energy that escaped as the, a result of the trauma. What could that look like? someone might come into this world and experience early trauma and never feel safe since. We go back to those early years where they did, where they expected to be cared for, where they expected the world to be safe and bring back that safety piece oh, I see. and incorporate it. It could be any, you know, whatever the person lost as the result, but that's not where the work ends. Because spirit and the practitioner and they cooperatively will bring back that energy, that soul piece. But now it's up to the person to welcome that piece into their life because they have to make space for it. And that's, you know, that happens when they walk out the door. How are they going to integrate that? How are they going to feel that, that energy back? You know, how are they going to just do it in a warm and loving way? And no, you know, they're shifting energy here. This is a shift in energy. And there could be highs and lows with that until it really um, is assimilated. So what do people describe after they leave sessions? And not just I'm healed, but do they have any kind of... Um, Kind of side effects or symptoms of having gone through this or the piece is now back and does it activate things and bring other things to the surface that then want to purge and leave sometimes you know it with my feeling um it, i will tell you right after the session um you know when a person i usually have a person on a massage table and they're bundled and you know we set them up and it's it's a practice you know process in bringing them back and all and you, you may appreciate this or not, but because I'm a Virgo, I feel like I have to be in charge at that point and say, do you have questions? Yeah. I, I explained this before because what I don't want them to do is start racking their brain and bringing them, you know, thinking too much. Yeah. What usually happens after session is they're just in peace. They're just in, you know, they probably couldn't explain to somebody half an hour later what happened because it's a process. It's a process. Right. And what I've seen often is when we do soul retrieval, when we bring that energy back, it's like um, blazing a trail in some respects. That you've, you've pulled this energy back, you're assimilating it. But it wouldn't be unusual for it to start a spontaneous healing of more energy coming back. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Because it may yeah. be connected to other things. Mm -hmm. I get yeah. that. Yeah. And then you bring back one piece and it may very well be the band-aid or the bomb for um, other pieces or other wounds that were experienced afterwards. The, this one piece takes care of the energy for all those wow. experiences. Wow. 
So this is, you would call this multi-dimensional healing work. Yeah, definitely, definitely. And then the other piece is, you, you know, there's follow-up after that, you know, just in terms of communication, let me know how you're doing. Um, you know, for me, a lot of times someone may come back, you know, for integration purposes, but in terms of shamanism overall, this isn't a thing that I'm going to say, okay, we're going to see you back in two weeks and we're going to see right. you back in two weeks right. after that. The person is the driver of their healing. So we give them everything we can give them. We, you know, let them know that However, as a sun sign in Virgo, you are. Would you suggest for best results to have an integration session with you or just an integration session? Let's say you're not trying to get them to come back to you. You're not some, you know, yeah. you're not a used car salesman. It's up to them. Yeah. But tell me about integration because that I've usually, done an entire episode on here about integration. Sure, you could. Yeah. Medicine after yeah. ER. I mean, so is it important in this work? Yes, yes, it definitely is. And that usually happens via phone call, via, you know, the communication that way kind of thing. Sometimes the person comes back. Or shamanic soul retrieval in person? I do. Okay. Because, you know, there are plenty of healing modalities that can be done remotely because they yeah. work in the quantum field. And I get that. And of course, most of my readings are done over Zoom and the internet. And of course, all that information is coming in from the quantum field why do you want them to be in person oh it doesn't have to be. there are people that do soul retrieval i believe it's just your yeah. preference yeah it, it's my part actually um with most of this with the exception well some other pieces i, I don't it's just my preference because it's mm -hmm. that i don't know it's just that connection now, for and i do like you to have earth in your chart Virgo, yeah. but also shamanism isn't really a galactic thing. It is. But when we think of shamanism, we're really working with the blood and bones of the earth. Yes. And there's a physical component to that. And yeah. someone like you might actually be able to get in the space more viscerally. You might have to work harder if it's over Zoom. I could see that there might just be a resonance you have when it's in person um, over it not being there. So... There's the other piece. There's the other piece of this that that for me, and this is my personal preference. I don't want to be mid soul retrieval and have the internet go down. Absolutely, very good point. Very good point. That would probably be the best point because your work is they're healing themselves. We get yeah. that. Chronicles of yeah. Chiron people, all of us out there, we're all on the same page at this point. We are all self-healers. We are going to therapists, healers, shamanic practitioners, because you all can broadcast a very specific frequency. And if that's available to us, why would we not do that? You know, yeah. like for instance, plant medicine works really well for me because it does take me longer to get into deeper states of consciousness. So it just helps to knock that out of the way without my, with my permission, but without my ego struggling as much. So if that's available, I'm going to use it, but I could learn to meditate and get just as deep as those yogis and those uh, monks and have those mystical experiences and rewire the brain that way. But I feel like for you, your work is effective, whether it's in person or not. But if yes, the type of work you do, you're kind of going in and with a rope tied to you. It's not like you can't come out. It's that, I don't know. I feel like if we were mid session, something would maybe get caught in the fray or there would be this kind of, um, we have to start over again. And it's just, I get it. I just want to differentiate that yeah. for people because some people are even hesitant to come to me. They're like, I'm not in the Atlanta area. And I'm like, do it on zoom. I've never given a uh, most of my readings are on Zoom and they don't feel less effective because they're on Zoom. But There's, he yeah. healing though, I have had healings done remotely and definitely felt a difference. But back in the day, I would have been very skeptical of that. I would have needed their magical hands to be there to do their magical thing because I just didn't get it. So I'm wanting people watching this to really understand that this will work. The reason she wants you in person is because the internet, really, something going out. We don't want to delay this, and we don't want to. Um, we want to have the best session possible. And there, you know, there is a boatload of work that I do remotely. 
Mm -hmm. um, you know, there are just certain pieces of it that my preference is in person. Uh, absolutely. And, it, and that's why I have waited to get a session because I want to do this in person with you. I am somebody, if I had a choice, I, will, I want to go to South America and do ayahuasca yeah. in person down there in, in the motherland. I want to go to the person and be there. I'm, I'm that way too. It makes it more visceral for me. So I am reserving that time with you. So everybody, I'm even going to her, you might want to check her out. So because I've just heard so many wonderful things, and I feel resonance with you. And also, you did tell me something one time. And I'm, I'm very in tune with things that are going on. And not many people, not to sound extremely arrogant, but not many people teach me something. And I'm not saying that I don't learn, I'm usually finding it. But you said something to me one time it was last year and it was one of the first times we've ever spoken and i mentioned to you that i had been seeing repeating numbers uh -huh. and i had seen numbers for a long time and i knew that repeating number sequences and things like that happen when you're resonating with something or when you're moving in a direction or and it's one of the ascension symptoms that are happening mm -hmm. right now is people are seeing a lot of number sequences synchronicities and repeating numbers you asked me um you said you're you're planning to do this plant medicine retreat in a few weeks i said yes and you said when did you start seeing the numbers and i said about two weeks ago when did you pay for it about two weeks ago don't you see you energetically affirmed it? So now you're being called to it and being shown the, the things that will lead you there. And I just was like, bam, oh my God, because it was that. And I have done this four more times since then. Okay, this plant medicine retreat, I've done it four times since. Every single time I pay for it. And I never stopped seeing repeating numbers since. But every single time I pay for the next one, whether it's four days before, a month before, it's like an incessant amount. Now, by the third time, maybe I was expecting it. It was confirmation bias, although I'm an Ascension facilitator and I don't believe in that shit, okay? I know confirmation bias is real, but not even thinking about it, just pay for it. And then all of a sudden they started to pop back up again so much that it was like living in a dream, like just fantasy land and it was like this is what gina said so it's i feel called to you for many reasons but i think just like penny i was probably called to her because yeah. she had the information i needed spirit knew it yeah spirit knew that her energy would meld with mine and we also have to trust that piece of it as well so mm -hmm. i want people to reach out to you but from my understanding you told me one time you do not all just work with anybody don't you oh. ask your guides if your work is right for the person? Because I find that very like honorable and I think it's important piece of this. There, yes. I, you know, and I think many shamanic pr practitioners would tell you that this, that I am not the practitioner for everyone and not every client is the right person for me. So there is a quick check-in that happens, you know, when somebody does contact me about, you know, am I the person or do I need to refer? Is there someone who would be better suited for the person that comes with, I can't imagine what it is, you know, or am I in a position that I can't do the work right now? And, you know, I, I'm thinking that using that as a, for, a, for instance, or for whatever reason, it just isn't right. So we, we have a network of people that we can refer to for sure. Yes. Yeah, but that rarely happens. I can't say never, but, but rare, yeah. Yeah, because I think by the time they've gotten to you in this type yeah. of work, they were led there anyway. So I'm, yeah. I doubt that people have been being given to you by force or anything like that. So this type of work, a lot of what we do tends to rely on a grid of energy and just kind of intuition and people being led to the right place because of the type of work we do. It's, it's interdimensional, it's multidimensional, it's quantum. So we kind of work in those fields rather than just meeting the next person for a business deal at a conference, which may be a little bit more physical and not be as guided. You know, I don't want to say 100%, but 
you said something about, you know, the messages or the validations that you see. There's something else that can happen when somebody signs up for a session or signs up for a class or a mm -hmm. workshop, an extended workshop. It can be almost the other way around. Yes, they may see the hawk or the repeating numbers, but they can also run into things that get in their way. Like things That's show up. What was happening to me? That's was why I it? brought that up to you because I said I felt like things were trying to stop me from going and yeah. that I thought it was my ego trying to stop me from going because it didn't want me to not be me anymore by yeah. transforming into something and you you told me well that's what happens well it can be ego it can be you know just hesitation what I've had a lot of times with people with classes they sign up for a class and then all this stuff happens or they have a flat tire or husband's sick or kids are sick and there's that push. How bad do you want it? How bad do you uh, want to step into yeah, the that's work? What you told me that's what you said to me. And the other thing is that your soul, your spirit recognizes um, in coming into this work how big it is. And there is a piece to it. Yeah, you have um, to be ready for this. Yeah. And sometimes you sign up for a class and you're like, let's get in there. And it's <laughs> Let this simmer in your consciousness for a while, this shamanic thing. Let it come to you a little bit more naturally. Let's not start on the wrong foot. Let's not, um, you know, let's not push you off the deep end. Let's, let's, I get what you mean. And I think spirit not being human and being very high vibrational has an awareness and a knowledge of this may not be the right time. And if they push past resistance, then they want it that badly. And then they can, I get it. Yeah, and I think when we try to fast track our spirituality, our walk, that can be a dangerous place. And you also bypass the fact that the spiritual component isn't bound by time and mm -hmm. that your experience needs to be different than what it is in that moment when mm -hmm. every single snapshot of the tree from the time it was a bring yes. all the way to the it was all beautiful in every single state so yes. and i we do have a tendency to go no i want to be shamanically certified already i want to be as good as gina millard or i want to be healed already and it negates the process part which is actually the entire point yeah but when you're hurting and when you're yeah. in the midst of your trauma or when things are resurfacing for you which they are in the past couple of days for a yeah. lot of people, which uh, is yeah. probably great for them to see yeah. this because this full moon in Scorpio is specifically agitating us. It's opposing Uranus, which is creating its genius flashes of insight and desires for change and feeling like restricted in some way. And then you've got Saturn over here restricting even more in that square. So there's so much energy involved with this full moon that with Pluto being the ruler of Scorpio, there's an unearthing, there's a resurfacing of things, but there's also things coming from the unconscious mind where the moon is the subconscious, but Pluto brings things out of the unconscious. And for me, shamanic work dives into the shadow. Yeah. and dives in this is all about shadow work but that's also the unconscious parts of us the parts of us that we deny that we're ashamed of that we're not conscious of and we don't give light to or acknowledge and shamanic work helps to reintegrate and create more wholeness would you say yeah and absolutely you know i always talk about a dear friend of mine who calls the work relentless it, it just the word, <laughs> the Pluto word Pluto is relentless this word yes this work is relentless yeah and it, it you know it's gonna probably keep going lifetimes and lifetimes I don't think I'm finishing in this one absolutely <laughs> I agree with you yes so Gina please tell us where we can find you if we have any questions or want to get in contact with you or to book a reading sure um my website is shamansfire.live and all my contact information is right there. So that's the easiest way to do it. Okay. And does, can they book on your website? No. What they'll have to do is, the best thing to do is text me because I can't schedule the way some traditional readers do just because of the length of the time that it takes, you know, to do individual work. Right. I can't say mid-soul retrieval, your hour's up. Right. It doesn't work that way. So I, I do it individually. People have to either text, email, or call. 
All yeah. right. So thank you all so much for joining us tonight for the Chronicles of Chiron, the Lion, the Witch, and the Healer. Thank you, Gina, so much for being here with us. Um, please like and subscribe below so you can receive notifications when I post more videos. If you're not already following me on Instagram and TikTok, you absolutely should at the.astromedium. And if you'd like to book a reading with me or if you have any questions, please uh, go to my website at www.christopher with a Y medium.com. Thank you everyone. Once again, we will see you all next week here on Soul Fire at 9.30 p.m. Eastern time for another episode of Chronicles of Chiron. Have a good night.